Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janie Parrish from the Wadsworth Area Chamber of Commerce, along with my co-host, Matt Hiscock. And Matt is the Director of Public Safety for the City of Wadsworth, as well as an attorney. So today, we have the pleasure to introduce our Ohio Supreme Court Justice, Sharon Kennedy. I think it's Sharon L. Kennedy, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. What's that L stand for? Lee, L-E-E. -E. Okay. okay, all right, good. So you were just in Medina talking to the Chamber of Commerce, and today you're talking to Wadsworth along with our wonderful students that are here. Okay, so what I would like you to talk about first is tell us about your journey, because as we were talking earlier, no one has a straight journey. Nobody starts out and says, this is what I'm going to be, unless there's somebody I don't yeah, know. Yeah, go, I'm going to be a Supreme Court Justice. Yes. Yeah, that's, so, a rare, that's a rare <laughs> yeah, that one. Right. Yeah, on the swing set, you're saying, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so tell us, um, Judge Kennedy, how, how this happened. Well, thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, students, for being here, and thank you for the opportunity to share my journey with all of you. Life is the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. If you haven't read it, for the young people in the room, get it. Read it, internalize it, and keep a copy with you every single day, because life unfolds just like that. When I was 10, I really believed all I wanted to do was to be a police officer. I held that dream in my heart all the way through high school. But it was a high school teacher, much like a high school like this, and he stopped me outside his general law class and he was speaking to me and he said, Sharon, it's, you did so well in my class. You can tell you clearly have a passion for the law. Law enforcement is not a ceiling. It is a floor that you walk across. You could be a lawyer and a judge someday. I remember rocking back on my healing and telling Mr. Shearing that just wasn't possible for someone like me. And I think at 17, what that meant was I saw the socioeconomic underpinnings of my family as a limitation, as setting a ceiling somehow on a dream, that it was beyond your capability to become a lawyer and a judge. That at, in the mind of a 17-year-old, I believed you had to be wealthy. You had to be part of the upper echelon, the elite of society, that it was a generational kind of career that your dads had to be lawyers or doctors or dentists for you to obtain such a dream. But law enforcement was the great equalizer in my life. So I followed my childhood dream after obtaining a degree in social work from the University of Cincinnati. I was the first to go to college in my family. And law enforcement was the equalizer because then all of the myths of what I held in my mind at 17 were shattered. I met my first lawyer. I met my first judge. There were plenty who were wealthy. There are plenty who came from generational families of lawyers, doctors, and dentists. But there were a lot of kids just like me, whose parents grew up poor in the Great Depression. My dad lived in public housing from age four till he was in high school. My mom grew up in a three-room cottage and they lived off the land. They were the first to go to college, and they were the first to realize the promise that America really has for all of us. The American dream is not dead. It is alive and well in the hearts of every single one of us, as long as you choose to believe in yourself. Law enforcement gave me that because I saw a lot of me, a lot of kids who were the first. But it was one of those things, so I also think you should be humble with your gifts and maybe challenge whether or not you really have the gifts or intellectual capacity. So I was um, being cross-examined. I was on the witness stand, and I literally had this thought of, I always wondered if I was smart enough to go to law school. And I had a lawyer asking me questions, and all of a sudden I had this realization, wow, holy smokes. That guy made it through law school. I know I can. I'm a lot smarter than him. I would ask a lot better questions. That was it. So I started on my journey to law school, ran that walk to the exit, and found myself in to the University of Cincinnati College of Law. And it was a second mentor in Judge Crehan. He himself had been a criminal defense attorney. When I was a police officer, we had cases together. 
And he has hanging up the guns of advocacy, and he was becoming a trial court judge in the general division of the Butler County Court of Common Pleas, and he asked me to come be a law clerk. And it was the second half of the system that I didn't see. As a law enforcement officer, the Fourth and Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, they're not words on a piece of paper. They're words that you decide when you're going to stop, arrest, seize, search. You decide those things and whether or not you're working within the constitutional confines of your role as a law enforcement officer. So I understood the criminal justice system, but he showed me the world of the civil justice system as well. What it means is we were kiddingly talking about a slip, trip, and fall. What it means to have a class action. What does it mean to have a car accident, liability, and all of those topics, and to watch great lawyers try cases. But it was literally my last day working with him as he threw that file in the outgoing bin and he said, so kid, what do you want to do? And I said, judge, I want to be you. I want to try a lot of cases, and someday I'd like to be a judge. Now my mom would say, if she were here, I wanted to try a lot of cases because I like to argue. <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> but I knew I was born to try cases because I loved being in the courtroom, whether that was a police officer being in the witness stand or just watching it. It was something that spoke to me. But I wanted to do what he did. I wanted to be a judge someday. And Judge Crehan said to me, kid, you're so young, so ambitious, so smart, you could do all that. You could make it all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court. And I looked at Judge, and just like I did with Mr. Shearing in that high school hallway, I said, well, Judge, that's not possible for me. Because immediately I saw a ceiling of my past being a barrier to the future. I saw the things I didn't have. You know, my parents voted. They're great Americans. But we didn't engage in politics, so I never had seen a campaign. I had never met an elected official other than Judge Crehan. And that world changed because he was the one who ushered me into politics. That led, led me to then meet my first congressman, Speaker Boehner, who would then become Speaker of the House, John Boehner, and his chief of staff, Mick Krieger, then Ryan Day all people who had great influence in where I am today, helping me make that first race in 1998 for a trial court bid, and then making it all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court, seeing that that pathway really wasn't beyond my reach. So to all the young people, your life is a Robert Frost poem. At 10, and through high school, I saw my past so clearly, just like the poem speaks. You can see it, you know what it looks like, but then all of a sudden on that journey, another path opened up. And for me, that was law school. And from there was a trial court judgeship. And from there was serving as a justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio. And just like my dream unfell, unfolded, yours will too. There are no ceilings in your life unless you put them there. And those ceilings begin with the words of, I can't, I am not good enough, or I am unworthy. But those are only things that you hold on to if you believe them, because what the rest of the world says, the limitations that others see, those are not yours. Life is a series of floors to which you build stairs to achieve what you want to achieve. Never doubt your worth, your capability, or that you're worthy of it, because every single one of you are. You could all be a justice at the Supreme Court of Ohio, just like me. Wow. <laughs> what a great story. Tell me what is the absolute best thing about being an Ohio State Supreme Court justice? I can't just be one thing. Okay. Um, I say the rule of three. So the first great thing is you get to see all of Ohio. I've been to Wadsworth many times. I've I, never seen you. Well, that's because you haven't been where I've been. <laughs> okay. So we'll exchange cards and the next time I'll hear, I'll see you again. Okay. But literally, 
Ohio is so amazingly diverse, not just by terrain, but by people, all of them really good people. But across Ohio, I have visited all 88 counties multiple times. I think I'm on time number seven. And every county is unique and beautiful in its own right. And you really need to step outside and you don't need to drive to Florida for a great vacation. Drive down the highway and see what we have to offer right here in the great state of Ohio. So one is being able to see okay. the state. Two is connecting with people. I like people. I find them interesting, funny, but I also, on the rule of three, the work of the court itself. I love the variety and the opportunity to do things you would never do but for the fact that you're a justice at the Supreme Court. I would never have done a workers' comp case or a public utility commission case, a taxation case. I would never involve myself in an administrative state or looking at the regulations and does that comport with the law. To me, it was very exciting because you're learning a new area of law, oil and gas. Who would have ever thought that the Ohio Supreme Court would be dealing with 20 plus cases as it relates to oil and gas? That's something Texas or Oklahoma or North Dakota does. No, it's happening right here in our great state. But also you get to do all the things you used to do. So in private practice, I was a criminal defense attorney. I did matters for citizens who wanted to bring in action. I did divorce work and probate work, juvenile work. I did a whole host of things. I got to serve as a magistrate in the area courts, hearing cases and controversies of eviction or small claims, hearing people's claims. So it all comes right back home to being a justice at the Supreme Court of Ohio. Justice Kenny, what do you think about um, the most preeminent or, or important case that you've made a decision on? What do you, what do you think Justice Kennedy's most important uh, decision has been? I think that would be, uh, I think that is the hardest question to answer because they're, they're so different. All the cases are sure. different. But I think the first case where I wrote the, the majority, the first time I wrote a majority opinion and the first time I ever wrote a dissent were pivotal moments in my life. So the first case I ever wrote a majority opinion on was State versus Smith. And the question was, could you be charged with a misdemeanor of the first degree for violating a, violating a civil protection order when law enforcement hadn't served it upon you? And it really came down to where you were with the statute and what kind of justice you were going to be. You see, if you're a person who believes like me in judicial restraint, you follow the text of the statute that the General Assembly has given you. That the words are, if they have defined them, those are the words. That's the definition that you give those words. And if they haven't defined the words, then you take out a dictionary and you apply that based on the date that that enactment came to be. So if it was from 1911, you'd go take a 1911 <laughs> dictionary out. But you give life to the law as it was written. It wasn't necessarily the outcome that I wanted as a person. But that's not our system of justice. Our justice is you make the laws. You make the laws when you vote for the individuals who represent you in Washington or down in Columbus, where you have the power to pick up the phone and say there should be this law, but not that law. But because I don't own a black robe, I don't get a third voice. I don't get to erase your words or fill your words in or put my thumb on the scale of justice and say, I want this person to win because I think they're more worthy than that person. So to me, that was very pivotal in following the law because it also led me to realize I wasn't in Kansas anymore. When I made decisions in the trial court for 14 years, nobody read about them on the front page of the paper. But shabam, all of a sudden, you're a justice, and it's on the front page of the Columbus Dispatch. And people weigh in on what they think you did. And to me, it was very interesting to see that exchange and how people interpreted following the language of the statute. And I think the other pivotal time in my life was the first time I wrote a dissent because I was standing alone. And sometimes being alone is a kind of frightening and lonely place to be. But in reality, it really comes back down to that conviction that you have intellectually as a thinker, as a jurist. And I remember worrying about, was I missing something that here you have six other really smart people, 
six other chambers that have looked at it, and they're all disagreeing with you. And you, I kept taking out the language of the statute. What am I missing? What am I missing? And then I just decided in the middle of the night, I'm not missing anything. You have to have the courage of your conviction to demonstrate restraint at times when others say you're wrong and to write it anyway. And to me, those were the two most pivotal times in my career. True. Thank you. True. Great question. No, it's, it, it's always interesting, and you don't get an opportunity to talk to a justice about what they felt is the most pivotal decision that they've made in their career. I've got another one, Janie, if you don't mind. No, go ahead, Matt. So a lot of what I do, Justice Kennedy, deals with uh, policing, fire, EMS services here in the city. And in today's uh, society, and I know the young people know this well, technology is, is a part of everyone's lives here. You know, law enforcement in recent years has been challenged by the nature of uh, every citizen having something on, on a camera or on a phone or, or something of that nature. What, do you, what is your opinion of technology and the role in policing today? I think it's a great question, and I, don't, I do not think technology has eclipsed itself, that I believe that we will see greater technology advances, technological advances that aid law enforcement, but it is only one tool. It was a really interesting continuing legal education segment. He was a professor at the time. He did this class for us down in Columbus, but he himself had been a law enforcement officer. And what is real conversation with us is being members of the judiciary who would watch body camera footage and then try to determine what was really going on he gave you five vignettes. Now, having been a police officer, I knew he was going to try and trick us. So you're waiting for what are they really showing you? Sure. What does that body movement really look like? He showed us five. I was right on three of them. And he said, how did you know those three? One, they were exercising, but they were exercising in a way that the camera made it look like they were throwing punches like it was a fight. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, Professor, I've been waiting for you to trick me. I said, but the last two, I, I failed. And the last two vignettes was all about body action, turning out of a car, and you see a flash of silver. Would you have shot? Wouldn't you? I would have, but it was a silver chrome phone that you were seeing, not a firearm. So those split-second decisions and what you're seeing, but also all of the vignettes of the body camera to show you what you really can't see. Remember, it's a fixed lens. It can only see what it's pointing to. It can't see everything else, and it can't see or take account for things not in the camera eye. So if that individual isn't on camera, if that person had a hammer or a gun and you didn't see it, and then all of a sudden something else is occurring. I think it's a powerful tool, but it is only one tool. You still need to understand spatial, the circumstances, the tight quarters that you're working in, the situation happening before and after and in the moments, and making sure that when you are examining it, you're not second guessing law enforcement, you are looking at it as the tool for what was in the mind of law enforcement. You cannot erase that. A photograph cannot tell you what's in their mind as threat, non-threat. But it's important, and for the young people, careful what you put on social media. It is a forever footprint. It is a job ender because you don't even get in the door anymore for a college or a career or an employment opportunity as a result of what you're doing on social media. And even when you're not doing it, when you go to those parties, whether you're in college and somebody else has that phone, remember, everything you do, someone else can record in real time and it can be a career ender. Never a life ender, but it can be a career ender. So be careful out there. Respect yourself and it as well. I don't want to take your thunder no, away no. here. No, go oh right my ahead. Gosh. Okay, so this is amazing what you do. And there has to be times that if if I were in your position, and I might want to be a Supreme Court well, justice. Well, <laughs> there's time. I mean, how do I get this gig? <laughs> I want to know. Um, 
there's got to be times if I were in your position at home, I would be thinking, thinking, thinking all the time about am I making the right decision, you know, just questioning everything. And is that what you do? You do. I liken it to the geek side of me loves the research. So for my first oil and gas case, I you to come to my house for dinner. You wouldn't have been able to sit in a chair because all of my surfaces were covered in research materials and flow charts and thoughts that I had about how do I actually, what is this legal question and how does this impact the other 20 cases that we have in the queue? So to me, it's part of that problem solving, mystery solving part of law enforcement didn't really leave me in problem solving. But it's also that opportunity where I think some of my best problem solving comes when I'm not thinking about it at all. Where I'm out cutting my grass and all of a sudden I was like, wow, I didn't think about that. Or you're having dinner with someone and you didn't intentionally mean to drift away in your mind, but all of a sudden you say, wow, that's the answer to that. Or, ooh, I need to remember this and look it up. I keep a notepad uh, on my nightstand because when you wake up with those aha moments in the middle of the night, you want to go back to sleep. So you write them down so you don't forget them, but you still remember them. Just like all of you, students, thinking about those issues all the time. Now, what do you miss about law enforcement as a police officer? If I had to do it again, and now remember, I can't turn back the hands of time, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have chosen all an alternative time to have left. I would have liked to have stayed in law enforcement long enough to be a detective. I really believe that what I saw the detectives do, especially in cold case situations or solving a homicide to really helping victims, that problem solving and that piecing together the mystery that I was probably born to do, which is why I like probably. that aspect of being a justice or a judge or a lawyer so much, because you're still problem solving, but you're doing it in a different measure. But I really looked at what law enforcement did and does today as being honorable and noble. I believe that serving as a detective and helping people find closure in difficulty, crisis, and trauma would have been so rewarding. So for me, if I could still be a justice today and still make it here in the same timeline, I would have liked to have been a detective someday. Never say never. <laughs> I mean, my age, yeah. age is my limit. It's my expiration date for serving mm -hmm. as a justice. So maybe when I'm done here, I go back <laughs> as a detective someday. Or yeah. maybe in a book. Maybe I write, write crime it. novels. And I'm a detective in a book. There you go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, we're taping this, and so what we're going to do is um, stop our taping, and um, so, because we're out of time, but then... Oh, we, no! Well, we're going to talk to the students and our guests then. Fantastic. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you for letting thank us you. tape you. Oh, my I goodness like you. gracious. I like okay. you! <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Grace. So.